I just feel like any author I could get in with her would have the best time working on their books, which is all I want. I just want my authors to have amazing experiences with editors. This is You May Contribute a Verse. I'm Brenna Jennerup, kidlit author of The Law of Birthdays, illustrated by Marina Kondra, coming May 1st from Cardinal Rule Press. I'm joined by my co-host, Josh Munkin, kidlit author, dad, and science communicator, and podcast wizard, John Seymour, author illustrator of the newly released A Morning with Blueberry. That was our guest, Marissa Cleveland, agent at the Seymour Agency on what she wants for her clients. Get ready for Marissa to pull back the curtain on what it's like to agent, what she's looking for, and the one thing that will get her, her stoked on your submission. Oh, and we also discussed the importance of browser tabs and inbox ma- management. <laughs> Here's Marissa's verse. Yeah. 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 All right. There we go. <laughs> what splits your it. time? Um, is it Seymour that takes you down to Naples? Um, it's the snowboarding thing. The weather. So. <laughs> oh, I see. So when the weather gets, when hurricane season comes, we kind of head up north and then when it gets too cold and rainy and snowy we we head down south it's it's not business it's personal right yes but the main office is yeah. located in naples so it's right down the road from where i am so i do have fun going in there opening boxes of books from publishers and i have a, a desk there and a bunch of pictures and so when i am there it's fun <laughs> That's awesome. How long have you been with the Seymour Agency, Marissa? Um, I started in 2009 at the agency as an author. And then I remember I was at RWA in 2000, I think it was 10 in New York. And Mary Sue Nicole and I were all sharing a hotel room. And she was like, I was asking her all these questions about agency. And she was like, you would be great, you know, as a author representative. And that kind of started my whole like, what else is there in publishing? <laughs> But yeah, since 2009. It turns out for you, there's a lot more in publishing <laughs> than just being an author. Because you've got even a role, I mean, aside from uh, from author and agent, you are, can you describe your role? Executive director? Is that right? Oh, so that's taken on a couple of different um, iterations over the years. I'm, I've kind of stepped back from doing a lot of the like in-house administrative outreach. Um, There was a time when I was doing a lot of film and media outreach, um, but we've expanded and branched out. And so I actually just moved over into like the kidlet section when Joyce started in 2020, 2020. Um, Cause I had been, you know, I was like, oh, I'm gonna write this picture book. And it's so hard. Anyone who writes a picture book, oh my goodness, I have so much respect and admiration for them. 500 words, like I, I, yeah. So um, in <laughs> about a half a year into Joyce representing them and, and me being like, how do they do it? Um, I'm like, you know, I'd rather just represent authors who can do it. So so um, right now I'm fully pretty much agenting. Um, I do write every Sunday, but it's not necessarily like a contract or anything. Oh, oh wow. Okay. How So how many... How many clients do you have right now? Oh, uh, I have 20. I, I have my list on the wall. I had to let go. <laughs> I have 20. <laughs> wow. So is that, would you consider that like a full list then, Marissa? Or are you always sort of looking? 12, 13. Well, 13 of them are picture book authors and um, the other seven write oh, in wow. different spaces. So... N- no, I know a lot of, um, I actually have three, four. I have four mentees right now I'm working with this summer. So um, I've tasked them with going into my query box and trying to find someone we could co-sign together so they can you know, mentor, shadow me through the process. Um, I, I would like to have probably you know, a couple more, a few more. I, I would take as many as I read and I'm like, oh, I have to have this project or I have to work with this author. So I don't think it's full. I I know there's a lot of agents out there who who have like 40 to 80 to 100. Um, I'm just really particular, I guess, about who I work with. So I'm, it's my third year 
um, actually signing clients. So, so yeah, um, I've been really slow to uh, sign. I know other agents have signed a lot faster than I have. D- deliberate is maybe how you can characterize it. I and I, I want to dive into this because I, I. We've gotten, we've talked to a few agents in the past with differing levels of client rosters. And a lot of it has to do with your capacity, but also there probably has to be a consideration on your part for who the writer is, not only the work that they're producing, but whether you can sort of manage. And this is, Brenna, all due respect to the to the way that you write. There, you're a high throughput writer and you're <laughs> incredibly productive and I admire that. However, I don't I don't think that agents could have like have 20 Brennas. There have to be uh, a mix of Brennas and Joshes where, you know, the the, the Josh authors yeah. of the world uh, produce a manuscript every, you know, three months or so. Um, and it's 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 a little bit more manageable throughput. There. <laughs> Is that a consideration on your part? Um, actually, now that you pointed that out, it should be. Um, it's, I, I have authors. <laughs> I have authors who are. I, I think most of my list is very prolific, um, and then I have just maybe one or two who take their time. Um, but as a new agent, I love that because a lot of the time I spend is you know outreach. It's not like begging, but it's like outreach to editors. Like, Hey, can we chat? Like, can we meet? I'm coming to New York. Can I take you out for coffee? And then it's like, well, what do you, you know, what are your interests? What are your tastes? And I think of it as like, I'm the ultimate matchmaker, which is why I love this because I'm such like a, like a romance junkie. So I feel like I'm the matchmaker between these wonderful projects and the editors. And the more projects I have from my clients, you know, they're like, Oh, well, I just bought like this you know, teddy bear, but I'd really love like a shark. And I'm like, oh, I have it, you know, so, or I can go back to my clients <laughs> who are prolific and be like, I need a shark book right now, you know, and, uh, but no, that, that hasn't, that may be a consideration moving forward <laughs> in the future, uh, but it's not. I don't mean to plan <laughs> ideas in your head, Marissa. <laughs> yeah. So you don't necessarily oh, want still, slow books, still, people with a lot of work. To answer. Yeah, yeah, right. <laughs> <laughs> so I have I have a question following up on that with so you said you have 13 picture book authors. So do they also write other other things or are those picture book authors also um like be so I'm asking because as a picture book author we know that the market is sort of flooded with picture book writers right now. And so if you're going to sign one it seems like they either have to really stand out from everybody else you've got on your list or they have to be writing, you know, across genres. So do you, is that something you, you look for also? Uh, that's not something I've deliberately looked for. However, I do have one picture book client who, um, I, she queried me with a picture book and I was like, oh, that's really cool. I can kind of see the concept. But then I was like, what other work do you have? And she let me know about this upmarket and I was like, I want this one. She's like, well, it's not done yet. And I was like, but that's the one I want. <laughs> so I do have clients who write in in both the spaces. And then I have clients who, who came to me with a bunch of picture book ideas. And then they were like, hey, um, I was wondering, you know, after you met with this editor and, you know, these, this is what the editor is looking for, would it be worth it to move into like the chapter book or middle grade space? And I'm like, absolutely. And then I have other clients who... Are like I've always wanted to write, you know, this whatever it is, and I was like, let's do it. You know, I will find I'll find editors. I'll do outreach. I'll ask them to chat with me, see what they want, and then we can see, you know, how it can fit in the marketplace. Um, all my clients know I'm very new to the kid lit area, so I'm doing a lot of outreach. Like, what's been bought? Who's bought what? Like, is there too much of this or that? So they, I think. I have the best, I know everyone says this, but I have the best clients ever. And I think they just understand that, that it's all a collaborative learning process. So if they hear something, they let me know. When I hear something, I send out group emails like, hey, chatted with this editor. This is, you know, what's coming down the pipeline type thing. Who, whoever gets oh, me the yeah. first shark book gets submitted. <laughs> <laughs> no. <laughs> no, no, it's not a competition, right? Yeah. <laughs> 
Do you, um, so I know, I know the Seymour agency is kind of known in the kidlet world for, um, they like to only sub one manuscript at a time per, like per client or per, I guess, like according to your list, maybe like per house or however that works. Like I know, I know Joyce does it that way. Like they do one at a time and also sort of cycle through their roster. Is that something that you also do? Oh, um, one of the great things about working with Nicole and at the Seymour agency is we have a lot of autonomy for how we as agents um, kind of have our own processes. Uh, some, it depends on, it depends on the, the individual author's career goals and the level of work that's polished. So for example, I have one author, mm -hmm. her work is simply amazing. She has two separate projects that are two completely different voice, tone, everything from each other. So like the first one would go out on a first round. And um, unfortunately the first round did not get us huge fights from editors. <laughs> and so we had the second one go out on a first round at the same time that we put the first one out on a second round. So, I mean, there is a little bit of overlap there when I do subs, but it really is individual to each client. And it's individual to, um, because I have some authors who are already published and they have their brand and their set, but I have some that are debut. So we really look at, you know, this every, I put all my energy into that one that's going out and is this going to be your launch book? And then if it's not, you know, are you willing to shift or, um, I love when like editors are say like, oh, I love this, but I have this similar, we have something similar. I want to see more from this author. And then I can automatically start another round because I, it's very rare that I would do an exclusive unless it was like a specific request from the editor. So if an editor says, I'd love to see more from this author, do they have something like this? Then we get it ready and then that will go on around. So they may still have a, a title out, but I would put this one out too, because I don't want to just if we did get an offer from that one editor, I want to be able to go to other editors too and be like, Hey, we have an offer, which, which has happened. That was a real example. <laughs> yeah. You don't limit, <laughs> limit yourself. Right. Do you also do, um, cause I know, I know like a lot of authors are looking for, they sort of are like, yeah, I'm up for work for hire. Like if, if a work for hire job comes around, like, you know, can you tell me or, or, alternately, you know, like, will you ask editors, like, are you looking for work for hire? Like I have this author and they're interested. Like, is that something that you, that you sort of work on with an author if they ask? Um, I do our agency. Uh, we have, we have a really great way of communicating. So when we do find something from another editor, or if there's like a call out from an editor, we will share that. Um, also like we're always in contact with different editors at the, at certain houses that we know handle IP. And because I know a lot of editors that I'm in touch with, they may not um, have the autonomy to do IP, but they know who is in. And so I'm like, oh, I have these these authors who are interested in working on like this set project. And I've been fortunate enough to be able to witness it, not at the Kidlet level, but at the Y. Well, I guess Kidlet is YA, um, but at the YA and adult level, some really great IP projects developed from in-house. And uh, I know one of them, a lot of my clients are like, oh, I would love to get into like Disney IP. And so we had a meeting with, you know, some of the editors from Disney and we got to like talk to them, find out how, what the whole process is and just like how to get them more familiar with different projects coming up and what the editor is looking for. And, you know, sometimes you'll submit a work and the editor will be like, this is great. We have something similar for IP coming out. And then we have to go back to the author and say, you know, like if it is IP, these are the restrictions on it. It's no longer, you know, it's, it's, and, and, and also work for hire too. Um, like I know some houses that do work for hire and it's just that piece and it's your name, but like a lot of the back end is not yours. And so, you know, we have those conversations with our authors and I, I do have authors that are interested. So I keep them. <laughs> um, that, that is amazing because how fun would that be? Like, number one, I would love to work on like the Boxcar Children series because I loved that when I was a kid and I know that it's still going. So to write IP <laughs> for Boxcar Children, how great would that be? And also, also, Just I know this doesn't world, exist. Right. right. And I know this doesn't exist either, but I'm putting it out into the universe anyways. Bluey IP, how fun. I would love, love, <gasps> love yes! to write for that show because, oh my God, right? <laughs> right, Marissa? 
<laughs> okay. All right, you're there with me. I might have to sub to you. I mean, if you if we can do Blue EIP together, let's get on this. <laughs> So I absolutely love Bluey and I've been telling everybody that I can meet. I'm like, I'm looking for the next Bluey, right? Because so um, it's Penguin Random. It's Peng I'm your Penguin girl. Workshop. That's, that's me. License. <laughs> <laughs> that's licensing it. And I had to go to dinner with one of the editors that was like, yeah, Bluey is basically ours. And so in the store with like the stickers in the back, all the merch, everything. And I'm just like, this is incredible. So I was like, who are these kids, right? Because they're not listed in the credits. Like they, because they're children, they're children of the production people. The only credits are like the mom and the dad, like the adults. They had like yeah. real children. So I'm like, what's going to happen when the kids grow up? And she's like, oh, like AI or something to like fix their voices. I'm like, I want to be a part of that so badly. Like I, I just, so I definitely want the next yes! Bluey series like to, to hit me. Oh my gosh, Marissa, come on, I mean, let's don't team up. children Ooh. and I love them. Yes, yes, yes. Let's see up and do this. Okay, I'm so glad we're on the same page. This is amazing. <laughs> you heard it here first, ladies and gentlemen. Yes. Bluey, the next Bluey being made as we speak. We'll have to cut all this out because there'll be a deal by the time uh, the episode publishes. <laughs> it'll it'll be happening. No. How yeah. perfect would it be? I mean, if mm -hmm. Brenna, if you're like prolific like this and they need like, they need to keep pumping out those episodes. <laughs> yes. Yes. And it's true. I I could do that. I could do that job. I could. I like I know it in my bones. I want this job. <laughs> Let's I'm just like creating this like title for myself, this like job that doesn't exist, but I want it. I want it so bad. <laughs> Marissa, this podcast is the the only goal is for us to get above the slush pile for ourselves. <laughs> Oh my gosh. <laughs> okay. You're oh, for it. all right. <laughs> I mean, well, okay, you know, so you, so like, in all seriousness. Past, oh, no, I was going to say, one of your past, so I had to go, I don't know how, like, if you cut this or not, but I'm totally going to name drop here. Like, I had to go meet Allison Weiss for breakfast, and I know on her podcast she was talking about, with you all, about how, like, the, and when I was first subbing to her and stuff she's like yeah i'm looking for this and this and this and then when i went to new york we went she's like yeah this this is and i was like she is like one of my dream like i just feel like any author i could get in with her would have the best time working on their books which is all i want i just want my authors to have amazing experiences with editors and i'm like you're the coolest person in the world like i want to get a series yeah. with you and, but they do keep all the media rights and like all the sub rights so i'm kind of like hmm like as an agent i'm like i, I don't <laughs> What do but you I sacrifice, I... right? Yeah, that's part of their whole deal, right? <laughs> yes. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Yes. You can feel the joy in pixel, pixel and ink books. Mm -hmm. Yes. Oh, my God. So, okay. So, Marissa, so I, um, that reminds me of Allison because, yes, yeah, so we had her on the show and I would love, love, love to work with her. And I have, so I end up writing all of, I, ha I write lots of PBs, but I end up writing these accidental graphic novels because my picture books are coming out as graphic novels, but they make for really good series. And I have one on sub through my old agent who I don't, I can't, I can't sub it. Um, until the end of August, but we subbed it to Allison Weiss and I got a champagne rejection from her. And I was like, that is like, I'll take that. That's amazing. So like, if I could sub, like I, I have other stuff though, that I want to get to her because I'm like, yeah, I would love to work with her. That would be incredible. Um, but on, on that note, so what are you looking for? Like, if you're going to sign a client, like what are, what are you looking for? If people are looking to sub to you? Oh, so now it's kind of a tricky time frame because I have these mentees that I've charged with finding. So, you know, I'm very, I am, I'd like to say I'm excellent at self care. So I'm very cautious of like my time, but as an author, I'm also very respectful of the author's bandwidth. And so I've charged these mentees with finding clients we can sign together. And I kind of am approaching it from what is their tastes versus mine I'm not necessarily looking for them to come in with exactly what I want because my goal is their agents and training I want them to shadow me through the whole bring on a client process but then I'd also like them to be able to see how works they love they can envision and put forth a career for that author so now until the end of summer it's kind of weird because I haven't been looking specifically to fill any holes on my list but I 
I'm not one of those people that I'm super conscious about um, what I look for as opposed to voice. And I know I've had varying process uh, shifts, you could say, about how I want to do this. But typically, like when I get a query, I read the pages first and I read them out loud because this way I don't worry about grammar or punctuation. I just read them out loud. And if I can get into it and hear a voice in it, then I'll go read the query. I'll be like, oh, who is this? I love the writing. So for me, it's it's about the writing first. And that's why I'm always like, do you have anything else? Is this, it, it can be their only book. But, you know, like, do you have anything else? Do I like your voice across the line? Was this one just one you spent, you know, 10 years perfecting? And, you know, all your other stuff doesn't sound like this at all because all your critique partner's voices are there. And so, so yeah, I guess I'm just looking for, like, characters I want as my best friends. That's That's how I always put it. Any age level. <laughs> that's a that's an adorable perspective. I, th- it's an yeah. interesting thing to pull apart. It can the the notion of it can be their only book. Um, and and I think of conventional wisdom being, oh my gosh, you got to have at least a handful of manuscripts as a picture book author uh, to submit because they want to see a diversity of work. Is that not not necessarily the case, or or are we talking? You know, picture picture books might be a different animal in terms of what you sub and what you need to have in terms of backing your career there needs to be more than just one sort of manuscript there to build a career off of so i may be too new in this space and not know enough that i think just one is fine i do have some clients who only have one i think mostly because i only had two ideas for picture books for myself and i would never write another one ever and i don't like to say (laughs) never but and i still haven't (laughs) written them (laughs) so but you know, if I if they only have one, that wouldn't stop me. If I love the voice and the topic and and the person, I it's kind of funny because I have signed people that have books that aren't ready to go on sub, but I just loved them so much that during our call, I was like, well, would you be open to revisions? And as an agent, the business side is you know you don't want to give revisions away that they could take to another agent because I get that all the time. Like, oh, I did a rewrite after these agent comments, and it's like brilliant writing. So I always am like, well, if I'm going to put my time and effort into you, let's let's just sign, even though you're not ready yet. And I'm totally, I try to be totally upfront about it. Like, you know, I don't know how many more revisions it'll be. This is what I'm envisioning. Uh, if you sign with me, we can discuss it. <laughs> yeah. So here's, so yeah. here we talked about stuff that, stuff that Brenda's going to do with her career and some of the sausage making and what she, what she wants. And I guess one of my, one of my pre- preconceived notions is, <laughs> Um, and this is something that holds me back from being actually in the query trenches aside from my, you know, level of anxiety over not wanting to check my inbox a hundred times a day for, for responses is, um, the level of polish that I feel needs to be brought to a manuscript before it's queried. And what I'm hearing is, and this is not, not a mandate or a rule. This is a Marissa thing is what I'm hearing, but what I'm hearing is maybe don't, don't limit yourself necessarily to a level of doneness and polish that can or would or will come post signing post editorial pass um things like that so i guess i guess i had had a question a few minutes ago around you know what do you what do you want to see from people in terms of the, what they query you with or what they query see more agency with is it something that they should believe is going to be their debut and the start of their picture book career and i guess what i'm hearing is m- maybe not necessarily not it, Query with something that you believe in. Query with something that you feel has a lot of a lot of potential, but there's room for molding it into the best thing that it can be. Uh, yes, <laughs> exactly. Uh, I think yes, <laughs> it, the work does need to be polished. Uh, there shouldn't be like misspellings. If it's rhyming, the beats shouldn't be off. Um, I think the most that I notice in unprofessionalism would be in the query letter of how like the language that people use or in a response after they receive a a pass. Um, But as far as like the work, like I said, I read it out loud. So if there's like a comma or something, I mean, I've been through the the editing process, like 10 different editors get a hold of your work. They will catch it and you will catch it, hopefully. So I'm not worried about writing conventions. I know you can teach craft. If the story is there, the character is there, the voice is there, any one of those three, if I'm hooked on any one of those three, I'll be like, hey, let's work on it. Um, and again, it may be because I'm still new. I don't have a hundred clients. I am only looking to work on like what I call love projects. Like, and my, my clients know this because like one of, um, so somebody had queried me and I 
loved the voice, but I didn't love the topic. And I was like, I would never send this out on sub. And, but I loved another piece. And I was like, if you understand that I will never send this one out ever, ever, never, but I love this one and we can work on other stuff moving <laughs> forward. But I told them you will probably be better served with an agent who loves all your work, not just, not just pick mm -hmm. and chooses certain works. Um, because we were very open about like, what other topics do you want to write about? What is your platform? Who are you as a person? How that's identified through the picture books that you're trying to place in children's hands. So so that was a tough conversation, but in the end, it, I was like, you know what? I just think it, you need to find an agent that will better champion all your works. Because I, I knew like four of the ideas out of the 20 were not anything I would want to work on over and over and over again. So. I would happily yeah, take any of my manuscripts to the curb. That's yeah, true. I think, yeah, I think it did. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I'm not that precious about my ideas. Uh. <laughs> so Marissa, do you, so just, just to be clear, so you wrap like picture book, graphic novel, chapter book, middle grade, YA, like YA novel in verse, like, all, like picture book through YA, all of that. Yes. Um, my, and I okay. signed my first just, sci-fi just client because I love reading sci-fi. <laughs> oh, oh, Josh, get in there. <laughs> I'm a sci-fi reader, not a sci-fi writer. It's like, um, so here's the point at which I, I throw in my day job to the conversation. It happens once an episode, just like references to Bluey that come from from Brenna. Um, uh, yeah, I'm too I'm too close to science fiction, and I think I'm too close to, to agriculture, which is part of my day job. I can't communicate on either 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 of those. Uh, I love them too much. So, yeah. Aww. Well. So Marissa, how did you how did you get started? So you said you were you were writing first for the Seymour agency and then you decided to go into full agent mode. So did you how did that how did that look? Like were you mentored through the Seymour agency or a different agent somewhere else and then you came back around or how what what did that journey look like? So my journey started with <laughs> writing. <laughs> and then I uh, like I mentioned, Mary Sue and was like, you would make a great agent. Um, but you know, when you, when you go to be an agent, you're, you're asking an author to like trust you with their career, their hopes and dreams. I know because I had three offers from agents before I signed with Mary Sue. And so I, I know like what that anxiety can be. And that's a huge responsibility for any agent. So I started out, I was like, okay, well, I'll be like an, could I be like an assistant? So I started out with the title lit assistant, which I kind of just asked for, um, but I was really, you know, Mary Sue sent me a couple of contracts from her clients to look over, like, here, read, let's pinpoint, let's work through them, see, you know, to try to teach me. There wasn't anything formal at the time with, with her and Nicole. And so I got to meet with clients. Then I was working with a lot of clients who at the time, because it was back in like 2010, 2011 at the time, were like, oh, I need help getting my website up. Or what is social media that I need, my platform? So I was helping with that. Um, making some graphics. I have all like the little publisher stuff that I love to do and, and just helping out as, as basically like an author assistant for the literary agency. So I get to see like the whole process from like bringing on new people, everything. And then I signed some people and I made some mistakes and I don't have a thick enough skin. And I have a whole backstory for this that I just kind of bury because I like to not put negativity out into the world. So then I transferred my clients that I did sign that stayed to Nicole and I just stepped back and just started doing more like admin stuff. Oh, you need this uploaded. We need this done. We need in, in the back end because it is a lot in the back end that I never would have even known about. And like some of my mentees now are like, what? Are you kidding me? And I was like, oh no, you don't just get to sit around on a sofa reading manuscripts like what I wanted it to be. Like, oh, I'm going to read some manuscripts. <laughs> no. So <laughs> And then in 2020, so, oh, so then I had some books come up. So yeah, and then in 2020, I was like, oh, I'd like to, well, it was kind of 2019. I was like, I'd like to write this picture book now. I think I'm ready. It was two. And it was so hard. So from November to like April, and then I gave up in April. And I was like, Joyce, I want to start repping picture books. I can't stand that. I can't write them, but I love them. <laughs> and I was determined to find authors who could, could put that joy and level that I want out into the world. And now it's time for this week's book reviews. John's review this week, that's me, 
is Buffalo Wild by Deetra Haverlock. This is a spirited tale revolving around the buffalo's comeback from near extinction and is vividly brought to life by Asby Whitecap's dynamic and gorgeous illustrations. A thoughtful celebration of nature, cultural traditions, and generational bonds, this is a vibrant dreamscape of a book and is truly heartwarming and will both inspire and educate. I give this five roaming buffaloes out of five, maybe six out of five. Brenda's review for this week is How to Eat a Book, written and illustrated by the powerhouse team Mrs. and Mr. McLeod. This imaginative and colorful romp introduces kids to the idea that books can be whatever you want them to be, they can be taken with you wherever you want to go, and they can open doors you didn't even know were there before. Get your hands on this book so you can eat it before it eats you. Josh's review for this week is a book he comps to in another manuscript, La Princesa and the Pea by Susan Middleton Elia, illustrated by Juan Martinez Neal. Aside from being a repeat request by his youngest daughter, Josh loves it both for its humor and for the clever way it clearly deploys Spanish vocabulary in a story framework that is very familiar to kids. As John would say, eh. <laughs> as John would say, 10 soft mattresses out of 10. It's time for community shout out time. Love the podcast and want to support more great episodes like this one? We have a Patreon now, so choose the tier that works best for you and even grab some cool podcast swag. Big thanks to our current Patreons, Jenna, Stan, Katie, and Josh. Community shout outs, they're still around. Shout out someone amazing in the kidlet world. Or leave us a review and share this episode with friends. A big thank you to everyone out there listening. And now, back to our show. Do I have it right? The the timeline that you you had started repping and then were sort of like honest with yourself, I guess, about how, how things were going, that you, you transferred your clients and stepped back from agenting so that you could learn more and provide more admin support and free up time of uh, for, for the rest of the, the agency to sit around and read manuscripts, I guess, so to speak, before you sort of do dove back into the, the waters. Is that kind of the timeline? Yes, there was like a 10, uh, it was probably more like seven or eight years where I just focused on writing and, and assisting, hanging out with current clients and, and kind of just doing my own thing there. <laughs> Yes. That's really, did that's, get, that's really interesting. Yeah. Did you get a lot of, um, like while you were doing that, were you also able to look at like, like look through contracts with some of the clients who are being signed and look at like, you know, like foreign rights or like, you know, like negotiations and how to like negotiate, you know, uh, royalties and advance, advance payments and like all of that stuff too. Like, is that some, is that part of what you were also learning on that back end when you took the step back? Uh, yes. So one great thing is that right now, um, Nicole handles all our contracts. So we, when an offer comes in, we can negotiate the first parts, but um, at the deal memo, but Nicole will handle because she has boilers with certain publishers now with our agency that, that take precedence. So what they offer is, you know, they have to, she tries to get even a better deal each time a contract comes in. And because she's our central point for contracts she knows like oh well we just closed the contract here and they did this so they should be doing this for you too mm -hmm. so it's not like you know anything can slip under the rug but it was really interesting because i get to see how like authors get put into anthologies and like mary sue showed me how you know it, the hardest part was like and this is still a, a struggle for me even though like i own i have like three or four books coming out from my authors now is the royalties like when they come out from which houses from which titles who's been reporting what does it look like and i remember she was like once you have authors that have like 5 10 50 100 books out and you're tracking all their titles and all their back royalties and all and i was like oh this is like spreadsheet insane and, and i am a huge sticky note girl so i like um i have sticky notes for everything that i need to do <laughs> And my husband is like that project manager with like MS project and Trello and moving cards around. And, and I'm just like, ah, so I look organized to my clients and they know this because I have spreadsheets for everything for them. Like, here's your house. Here's your editor. Here's the date it went out. Here are the notes we got back. You know, all of that. They can just pull it up, download it and whatever. So if I'm abducted by aliens, they can be like, here's my work and where it's been. <laughs> but 
as far as on my end, I stare at sticky notes and I pick it up and I'm like, okay. And then I enter it into the spreadsheet and I toss it. So I know that it's, it's on them now. Like I'm very much, they are the CEO of their career and we're a partnership and you know, it, it's awesome because I have one client who'll be like, oh, I noticed like we're coming up on some nudges for these editors and they know which editors I nudge and which I don't because they've confirmed received and which do whatever that I'm, I can just text and be like, Hey, pull up your email, you know? So, so that's really cool because they, it's not like they tell me what to do or I tell them what to do, but we just kind of help keep each other on track so that nothing falls through the cracks. Cause that's like the worst thing in the world is when something that you thought was going to happen or was on a sticky note and got stuck to the back of another coffee cup. Yeah. So I, I don't even know where that went. I totally just rambled. Where did we start with that? How do we circle back? <laughs> we, yes, yeah, no, I we were asking learning. about the like, contract during negotiation. And, I yes. Was <laughs> I was learning during the years I was not representing a, an author on my own. <laughs> yeah. For sure. I think that that's really fascinating. Um, an advantage and a strength, it seems, for Seymour to have centralized oversight of contract negotiations while offering all of you all as agents independence in how you manage your client roster. And just to define terms, and you can you can correct me if I'm misunderstanding, when you say that Seymour has a, a boiler with certain editors and, and houses, that means that there are standard contract terms that um, that agent or that um, sorry editors and publishers can expect to engage in, like minimum standards for uh, for authors that come from Seymour. Is that right? Yes. Yeah, that's that's that was fantastic. A nice short answer. I mean, having standards that you can sort of, yeah, yeah, for sure, yeah, that, that having standards and, and no uh, no sort of ambiguity about what to expect from the from the contract process with Seymour, uh, I think is probably a, a relief on on all ends for authors, so that they know what to what what they may um, get, and then for editors who you know 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 what to expect and what to aim for for Seymour. Yeah. Well, one example would be like. Um when we first started building out our kidlet and we were receiving offers and we'd go through the contract negotiations, some of the houses have like, they use like outside counsel. So they would just send us the, the house's boiler that they send to everybody, including like authors that who aren't maybe represented or something. And so then Nicole would go back and be like, nope, we've already signed. Like they sold to this other agent who's a Seymour agent. So they need to start here at like, you know, say number three, instead of, the number one level of how great a contract could be out of like one through 10. And so then from there, we try to even make it even better based on other, other things. And a perfect example of this is um, bonus language for, for winning awards. So like a normal contract coming in from a publisher may not include bonus language, but from that publisher to us, it, they're like, oh yeah, and we already know you have the bonus language. So that's not something we need to start a negotiation about like, oh, can you add this in because it's already there? So then we can jump our negotiations off to somewhere else. Like, well, we just want North North American rights this time because you kept, you know, World English last time, but you didn't sub it anywhere. And we've got sub rights. You know, we have foreign rights agents that are located in, you know, France. And we have a whole, you know, department there that we know we can get it in. And so, and so our negotiations don't look as long as they do when we first started with that publisher, because when we first start, we ask for like you know, 10 different things and we might get like seven. And now we start at number three and we can get seven and that brings us all the way up to almost, you know, to 10. It's not exactly like that, but it, that's what I meant, yes. <laughs> we're, we're boiling it down. It's much more complicated than we need to get into for sure. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So, so you guys do have a foreign rights department for the Seymour agency that does foreign rights specifically and works with those other agents or how, how does that work? Yes, we do. We have um, sub rights agents who are in, I, I can picture it now in our main office. We have this post-it note on the wall that lists all the, the territories and who the agents are and who covers it. And then we have an in-house who um, make sure that we have like our catalogs all up to date, our titles. And one thing that Nicole does for me, because I, I just don't have the bandwidth for it, is every time my contracts are finalized, she'll go through and she'll write at the top of them for me, like, 
film yes you know um foreign yes or no and then i know which ones we're allowed to shop so that i can take that title to our foreign rights um, agents and people and be like hey you know we get these but but like oh they kept dramatic or they kept merchandising so then i can't for that but she always points it out for me on the top of the contract because i'll read through the language and try to highlight it and i'll be like i don't know I, that's one that, that I love that she is our centralized contract person because she can find it and let me know in like two seconds. <laughs> I, it occurs to me to just be flabbergasted as a, as an unagented a writer only of picture book manuscripts, the, the future in which there may be, there may be a time when I have to be concerned with who has my merchandise rights as someone who may sell something that is like a physical product produced by my creativity. Um, it's, it's a fascinating concern. It's, it's, it's very, um, it's very legal, uh, and it's very contracty, but it's, it's a fascinating part of the process, just how, how finely it's subdivided and something that we don't, we don't really we don't really talk about as authors because I guess it's not our business, but it also is really, really mysterious. Oh, I think it's absolutely your business. Um, I, mm. I made a little Instagram story the other day about how the pro past me would be like, I don't know. I'm just so excited that I get to deal with these problems now. And so I want you to remember this moment for, for future you when you're like, I can't believe that Disney wants to put out a Tumblr with this image and I never approved it, but it's your image from like your debut book or something. And you know, and you're like, it, and it's these types of problems that are like, I can't believe I'm arguing about, you know, a, a royalty percentage rate of selling just from, I don't even know, like whatever, but you know, this is I didn't want to use a real example, but the whole, like the whole pileup of everything I had to deal with last week and the beginning of this week for a couple of different clients, I'm like, I was so frustrated. And then I just took a moment and I was like, past me would be so excited to have these problems, you know, like to actually be in the middle of having to argue about like AI contract language and, you know, dramatic rights because we want serial, you know, whatever. And, and I'm like, yeah. So, so yes, you will have to worry about that. I think it is an author's business, but I think it will be, a glorious one to have <laughs> yeah yeah these are cool problems to have they're fun <laughs> things to have to worry about when you get to the point where you can worry about them for sure yes 100 percent. which also reminds me of a bluey episode where the dad goes into the garage and he's like here's this old box of things from when i used to be cool <laughs> it'll be a cool problem to have <laughs> <laughs> Oh, Lord. All right. Well, I'm curious about um, I'm curious about your mentees. Um, I had some interactions with Jamie Rudarte uh, in the past. Uh, in the past, I don't know. It's been several months now. I did a thing where I had offered to uh, do some do some out loud voice recordings with my nice podcast mic of several um, several manuscripts, and uh, she was one that I got a chance to read, read it a couple of different ways, and sent her the file. And uh, and here she is advancing her career. I know she's repped by Joyce. Um, and now to see that she's she's baby agenting or, or or training training up is is fascinating as well, just to um, j just to sort of slice and dice like what what is the process by which you assess who is going to be a good fit as as a mentee? Ooh, okay. So we put out a blog post about what we wanted the goal of the mentorship to be. And then um, Nicole and I looked through all the applications and we kind of narrowed it down to, I, well, I don't even remember, but then from there we narrowed it down further. And then from there we asked for some interviews. And one of the things that stood out about Jamie was the, from my perspective was the organization level. Um, it, I feel like you have to be very organized to be accountable to your clients. And Joyce was like, oh yeah, she, well, first she got a glowing recommendation from Joyce, which was absolutely everything. Second, she was interested in repping areas that she does not write in. So, and I happened to have clients at the time who I knew I would like to match her with. And then third, because I always love to expand like where I rep and I love learning and connecting with different editors, um, the fact that she is interested in a little bit uh, work that's different from me would help me also broaden my would help me also broaden my perspective and range. 
of who I am helping enter into the publishing space, which, you know, according to some people could be terrible once they're in, but it's also an awesome problem to have once you're in. Right. So like, um, that was just one of the, the really big draws to me was, I guess, her organization. Because the other, one of my other mentees, Rosa, she was super organized. She wanted to be in this space. She already is represented by another agency, like not even part of Seymour. But just the level, um, I asked them all to write like a philosophy and how they would fit into the literary landscape and how they'd be a great literary citizen. And just the way that she phrased it was like, this person is somebody that I want to help usher in other authors. So, so and I to always tell Nicole I'm a terrible judge of character. So she was with me every step of the way in every interview, every bit of it to give me like <laughs> her perspective on things. So... <laughs> <laughs> just watching over your shoulder to make sure you didn't uh, onboard somebody completely inappropriately. That's funny. Right. <laughs> well, I'm, my, my, my future as an agent is shot then if it takes organization because that's not, that's not, not my forte. Oh, no, there are agents who are not organized. <laughs> Even with an agent, <laughs> they don't do you. well. <laughs> <laughs> and that's like, oh yeah, I know there are, so, there are agents, like my best friends who are agents that are not organized are some of the best salespeople, agents, keen eye to find talent and work that I know. So it takes all kinds. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Um, what, what is the time commitment like, like for the mentees? And then also like for you, I, I assume that you're a full-time agent, but I don't know. So are, do you have another full-time job or are you, do you full-time agent? And then for the mentees, how much of a time commitment is it for them? Uh, so that oh, I'll start with uh, my phrase I always use. In 2017, I left the easiest job I ever had to see if I wanted to move into publishing. So I don't have another full-time job. I do believe those who do should also teach. So I, I try to adjunct a class here and there, um, working with thesis students or, or whatnot. But it's not a regular thing. And I actually haven't um, taught in like over a year now. Uh, so that's kind of bad since I believe those who you should also teach. But no, I don't have another full-time job. This is it. <laughs> My days sometimes are, you know, 16-hour days, and sometimes they're two-hour days, just depending on my bandwidth and my level of self-care needed and the time of year. Like summer, I always try to take summer Fridays because I like the, the illusion that I can – we've done this every week now. Every Friday afternoon, we'll go get our coffee and go to Barnes & Noble, and I'll buy some books, and I'll just sit in the bookstore and be like – yeah, this is what it's like, right? But it's it's not like that at all. I end up working every Friday afternoon. <laughs> <Like, laughs> um, so yeah, it, the the level is <laughs> dependent on the day. Was that the question? <laughs> I don't have a full time job. This is my yes. full time thing. The mentees, uh, the mentees are all individualized. So they, some of them, like we have modules with videos that they can watch to learn the different aspects of agenting. Uh, that the other agents put together is absolutely fabulous. I love it. And then they just connect with me when they have time. So like one may have a full-time job, so I know I'll hear from her, you know, every evening or every couple of evenings. Some of them I hear during lunch. Um, we Zoom when they get to a point where, hey, I found this manuscript, let's chat about it. Um, and then matching them with my clients, but it's all on their own timeline. There's not like a, a deadline or I'm not asking them for a commitment. So some weeks I may not hear from them, but like for like three emails and other weeks it's like 10 hours because I know like they have free time and they're diving in. And this is, oh. this is, I guess, where in, in, in the conversation around um, diversification of how you spend your time, this is where maybe I can sneak in how interested I was in the book that you and Simon put out uh, called There Is No Box, which is a, a leadership, like a business oh. corporate leadership book um, that you, you co-wrote. I'm understanding that our audience is mostly kid lit. We won't spend too much time diving into this business book, but I'm, I'm curious around how, how that came to be, what else there is that you and Simon work on together and, and where that fits in the kind of constellation of, of things that you do. Oh, so this kind of slides into age. So in 2017, when I left the easiest day job I ever had, I went back for my doctorate and studied organizational leadership. And so a lot of it was like me being able to listen to Simon do like lectures and everything. And along the way, I was finishing one of my romance novels for Entangled. And I would get emails from people saying, 
you know, hey, I, I bought your book because you're Asian, but there's not even an Asian character. But I write about the world around me and what I see. And a lot of it was like, oh, so I'm, I don't, I'm adopted. So I was raised in a very like um, Catholic white New England at the time. And, and even in college, I tried to join like the Asian American club, but they all were speaking Korean and they wouldn't speak English to me. And it was just a very like jarring experience. So my romance novels, and this was 2017, 18, 19. And that was when I was like, I'm going to write about being adopted. I'm going to write this picture book. And then that was, then it came over to April, 2020, when it was like super hard. And I told Joyce, I'm like, forget it. I'm just going to wrap picture books. And so that was like a very deliberate move on my part. But every, so it, it, the book came about because of the, my leadership studies and my husband's studies and leadership and his lectures that I would listen to um, when it went online. And then just putting together different presentations that he gives when I would be able to go. And I'm like, his stuff really needs to be a book because it's a framework. And actually there is a book, um, there's a course designed around the whole relatable project leadership development. You know, you are the CEO of your own life, but that philosophy I brought into my agenting and looking for the clients that I want to work with and their level of understanding for their career, where they are, uh, you know, even what this industry is like. And I tell them all the time, I'm like, I write every single Sunday. I don't, you know, whether it's contracted or not. So Sunday nights, you're never going to hear back from me. But I mean, they usually don't hear back from me or, or ping me on the weekends anyway. But again, like my schedule is very fluid. So, you know, some weeks I'm like 16 hours and one of my clients, I emailed her at like 11 o'clock at night. And she was like, why are you still like up? And I'm like, well, I know you're on the West Coast, so you're probably still up, you know, um, and then some days I actually, some weeks I, I do stick to like the traditional schedule, but, um, I, I, you know, it's, it's very fluid there. And that, that philosophy from the book is just kind of how I base what I want my clients and authors to feel and how I like to operate. But the, uh, so, so that... this is, this is your first, yeah, go ahead. Uh, sorry. Sorry. No, it's okay. I was just going to ask, that makes me think how, um, like, it sounds like you must be really responsive with your clients because if they're getting, you know, emails at like 11 or whatever, and they're just like, why, why are you still, why are you still messaging me? Like, thank you so much for getting back to me, but like, you're still awake. So it sounds like you don't, you don't tend to let like emails or texts or whatever, or questions sort of slide. Like you are pretty responsive in terms of agenting. Oh, um, so email is the bane of my existence. And I try to let my clients know I've at least seen their email, like um, within like a day or two of it, if three days go by or, and they haven't heard back from me, I always encourage them to nudge me so that they know it didn't get like in my spam. I have one client for some reason, all her email goes straight to my spam. And I try to check my spam every week just because of that. But now she'll text me and be like, send you an email. And then I know I can go like look for it and just confirm. So I do try to confirm, but I may not actually like answer whatever my client's email is like at that moment until I can get, I have a weird thing where I don't like to email unless I'm on my computer, but I do have email on my phone. So I may look at it and then, you know, I won't respond because I'm on my phone. So I, I'm yeah, a firm fair. believer m myself in the the triumvirate of prioritization. Do defer or delegate, and I cannot. This goes back to my lack of organization for my own, you know, work life. People will hear from me immediately. I will drop everything to respond because otherwise I will lose track. So kudos to you for being organized enough to sort of say like, I'm going to flag this email and, and follow up when I'm actually sitting at my computer. Not how, not, not how I, not how I operate. Sadly. <laughs> Sometimes in our, um, our little group chat, I'll let my clients know. I'm like, I'm down to 800 emails and I have this one client who's a zero inbox. And I'm like, I wish I could get there. Like, that is my dream goal. And it will never. And then the moment I'm like, I'm almost, you know, I'm going to do inbox zero today. I'll get like 25 emails. And, and I'm like, and they all have to be addressed. They're not like quick questions. So I'm like, that goes out the window. <laughs> I'm going to ask you a personal question. Is Simon, is Simon a zero inbox person as a project manager and leader? Uh, I would say yes. I, I would say yes. Yeah. I'm, I bet I'm if I picked up his phone inbox right now, person he would well. have zero. Yeah. <laughs> I am a zero inbox. <laughs> I am a zero inbox. They make me so anxious. I can't. Oh my gosh. And my husband, my husband is not. My husband has like 1,200 emails 
in his thing and I cannot look at that number. I'm like, I need to walk away. That's like, I get so much anxiety from that. But I have like, most mostly zero if I can. If it's something I need to read, then it's like in there, but nothing more than like, I can't have more than 10 or I just get like a lot of anxiety. I'm like, I have so much to do. So. Oh, 10 would be. Okay, so how many tabs do you ever have learning. open at one time? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so yeah, not that many. I don't, I can't have that many. Like I have to, because if it's open, I'm like, that needs my attention. So let me give it the attention so I can like get rid of it. But my husband opposite, there's like, they're like this big because he's got so many. Guilty, guilty as charged. Yeah. I, I've had to close, I think, uh, a dozen and a half tabs in my browser since we've been having this conversation for the past hour. And I've still got three <laughs> dozen tabs open. That's just sometimes oh, oh a disorganized gosh. mind is how... How people get things done. I like to represent uh, the disorganized among us. We can still achieve, <laughs> right? I had 26 tabs yes. and I had to close out of everything before I clicked here just to make sure that I didn't have lag on my end. And I had so much anxiety. I'm like, I hope I remember all of them that were open. <laughs> and I was like, I should have just tapped. It's oh, me. I'm, gosh, the yeah. I'm the problem. It's me. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Oh, you are right to keep the tabs. Totally, totally. <laughs> oh my gosh. We've gone far well, afield at this point. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Well, what I was, I was going to say, I mean, we are edging up towards the hour and I would just, before it gets away from us, I just wanted to say, um, thank you so much for coming on and being so candid with your answers about agenting and all of this stuff, because like, we, you know, we do have a couple of agents come on the show, but it's always so refreshing to have, have you come on because we get this insight into the business we wouldn't otherwise. And it just was really, really nice talking with you. Like, we, I really enjoyed it. So thank you so much. Wow. Well, thanks so much for having me. I, I love, I've listened to a, a couple of different um, ones of your episodes because I'll hop on the treadmill and I started doing podcasts. I'm like, oh, you know, so, and I think it started when you had Joyce and you mentioned that Joyce was on. And I think that was the first one that I actually clicked on to just listen to. And I was like, oh, you know, so I agree with her about her wish lists. So if anyone goes back and listens to her, they can, I can see why we don't no like space any script wish right. <laughs> Thanks for listening this week. Find all of our episodes and other associated links and information at linktree.com slash verse show. Or reach out to us on Blue Sky, Instagram, or Threads. Thanks again, and we'll see you next verse. Bye!